Roaring Twenties were roaring, and the Depression lay just around the corner when the arrival of a new star, Jack Minzy, occurred in Flint, Michigan. At the age of one year, he had already started to self-actualize. Jack, as the youngest of the family, had to share the love of Jack and Flory with his sister, Maxine. The Minzy name is Scottish, and their ancestors put their kilts on two legs at a time, most appropriate for a stay at Minzy Castle in Weem, Scotland. As you might have guessed, Jack was a Boy Scout, and a good one at that. As a young man, always with a horn in hand for his junior band, his band leader always had Jack play his favorite. He would say to Jack, can you play Far, Far Away? The Minzies left Flint and settled in Ypsilanti. Jack's father got a job in the Willow Run bomber plant in 1942. Jack graduated from Roosevelt High School in Ypsilanti. It was here that Jack got his first taste of the Eastern Campus. Having picked up the uniform habit with the Boy Scouts, Jack continued this trait with a stint in the Naval Reserve. This allowed Jack a chance to pick up some leadership skills and a little money for his studies at Eastern Michigan University. The Navy also aided the Menzies in locating their boat near a school of fish. Jack graduated from EMU and took a teaching position with Huron Valley Schools. However, Jack's stay at Huron Valley was limited due to activity in Korea. Jack took his basic training in Georgia and then left for Japan in 1952. Jack was released in 1953, but not before he was awarded the Soldier of the Month with his company in Yokohama, Japan. Jack and Jill might have went up the hill, but it was Esther that came tumbling down after him. Meeting in Milford, Esther Pritchard, the daughter of Louise and Ralph Pritchard of Medina, Ohio, soon came under Jack's watchful eye after she graduated from Kent State. Esther attended a mock wedding with Jack at the Bertha Baker School in 1953. The experience, as you shall see, had a profound effect on both of them. Esther and Jack tied the knot in 1954, and they have held to their wedding vows. Jack, always a fast learner, began to begat. And they begat David, Daniel, Deborah, and John. And David and Debbie married. And they begat Michael, Megan, and Caitlin. And Daniel and Barbara got married. And they begat Christina, Stephanie, and Samantha. And Deborah and Rob got married, and they begat Dorothy, Robbie, and John. And John and Anna got married, and they are getting ready to begin the begat. Here are Jack and Esther again, renewing their vows on their 35th anniversary. The mock wedding at Bertha Baker really did start something. Hi, I'm Art McCafferty and I had the distinct pleasure of having Jack Menzies as my high school history teacher and psychology teacher. He was a great teacher, as you might well expect. Those are great moments, and those were truly happy days. Jack was also our high school basketball coach. He took our school's number one rankings in the state. In fact, aided by great players like Davidson, Baker, Mastic, Sanford, and Gould, his teams had a record of 11 and 6, 16 and 3, and 15 and 3. He also helped out in JV football with his lifetime friend Denny Boyle, now at Western Michigan University. Jack later became the principal at Milford High School and was there until he left in 1965 to pursue doctoral work at Michigan State University. Jack still keeps in touch with his former staff, people like Kay Maher, Agnes Tripp, Denny Boyle, who is now at Western Michigan University, Clifford Shear, later to be superintendent, and Jerry Ganzel and Louise Bull. I recently put together a 30th reunion for our 1958 graduating class, 
and we had Jack as our guest speaker. So just sit back and relax for two minutes of some real vintage Menzi. Art asked me if I'd make some comments about education, and I, I said I would try to do that in a general way. Let me uh, try to give you a little background. Some of you may appreciate this. This is a letter written by a mother, uh, written to a mother by her daughter who's in college. It says, Dear Mom, I'm sorry that I've not written to you earlier, but the fire which I had in my apartment has left things so in a mess that I was not able to do all the things I wanted to. The concussion is almost gone and my vision is beginning to clear up. George, who was the gas station attendant who noticed the fire and rushed to my assistance, has been just a jewel. I've been sharing an apartment with him and it certainly did help out when the going was rough. I had not written to you about him before because I know that you might not be too receptive to him since he is neither of our race or religion. Since we learned this pregnancy, however, we have been planning on getting married. Now that I brought you up to date, I want to tell you that there was no apartment fire. I did not have a concussion or a skull fracture. I was not in the hospital. I am not pregnant. I am not engaged, and there is no boy in my life. However, I am getting a D in history and an F in science, and I want you to see these marks in their proper perspective. <laughs> well, I'm going to try to give you my proper perspective about some things related to education. You know, education has really changed a lot since you come here. Maybe it's just that I'm nostalgic when you went here, but you were here in the years of 1954 and 1958 that you went through high school. I think when you graduated, you had 122 in the graduating class. That's pretty close. I noticed the letter that I sent kept increasing, but I think it came on to be 122 when you graduated. One of the nice things about when you went here, but that I really like about education, because I look nostalgic at that time as being one of the best times of my life, with all the things that I had, and I try to think about what was it about Milford? I never had that feeling about the Flint schools, the Ypsilanti schools. What was it about Milford that made that happen? I think one of the big things was that everyone knew everyone. You know, and it was such an easy atmosphere to be involved in as a teacher or a principal. As a principal, it was really easy. You know, there were no non-known people to me. When I went to a basketball game and somebody acted up, I didn't have to wait through the crowd and get all of them. I just looked up and gave them my fatherly luck about, you know, if you don't shape up now, I'll see you Monday. They knew that I knew their name. What's more, they knew that I knew their parents well. And my biggest hammer in those days was to say, okay, one more time like that, and I'm calling your folks. That was a kiss of death in those days. Nowadays, the folks show up with an attorney, and they're going to sue you. You never do that kind of thing. Charles Stuart Mott and Frank Manley were two individuals that were to change Jack's life forever. As one of the first recipients of a Mott Fellowship, Jack Minzie later became a real force in the field of community education. After a short stint with MSU and the Michigan Department of Education, Jack became the director of the Center for Community Education at Eastern. On hand to assist with the center were Mr. Manley and former EMU president Harold Sponberg. Eastern Michigan University produced more community educators than any of the various community education centers around the United States. Those assisting Jack in the center included Bill Hetrick, Jim Satterfield, Donna Schmidt, Jackie Rogers, and Orv Cabot. The center held monthly meetings for community educators and introduced community education to Southeast Michigan and other states. The center also produced printed and audiovisual materials. Here's a video from the center's archives with Jack and assistant director Donna Schmidt. Education is an idea which is growing very rapidly around the country. 
Much of the phenomenal growth which we have witnessed in community education has taken place in the last 10 years, and yet the idea of community education goes back some 40 years. During those early years, we had some people in community education whom we might call pioneers, who kept the idea alive at a time when it was probably less popular and more difficult to do. The Center for Community Education at Eastern Michigan University, a MOT-funded project, has decided to capture some of those pioneers on videotape. I'm Jack Minzy, the director of the Center for Community Education at Eastern, and this is my associate, Donna Schmidt. What you will see here is an edited version of the interviews which we conducted with those outstanding pioneers in community education. The double-barreled approach of the Center for Community Education and the Educational Leadership Department at Eastern Michigan provided tremendous leadership in the community education movement. The Minzy and Latarte duo teamed up to write the definitive text entitled Community Education from Programs to Process and later the sequel Community Education from Programs to Process to Practice. Hi, Zach. I'm sorry I can't be there personally to welcome you to the world of retirement. I'm sad in a way that you are retiring and thereby creating a void in community education that will be extremely hard to fill. On the other hand, I'm happy for you because you now can take time to smell the roses, hold hands with that lovely wife of yours, and enjoy the grandkids. 30 seconds doesn't give me enough time to say all the things I would like to say. However, as you know is my custom, I got a three words are for you. You're the greatest. My wife thinks so too. God bless and keep in touch. At the 25th year anniversary of the National Community Education Association, some of the most influential people in the movement showed up for the photo opportunity. They included Harding Mott, Tom Fish, Doug Precunier, Mrs. Manley and Mrs. Mott, Don Weaver, Sue Fletcher, Dwayne Brown, Bill Kerensky, Kurt Van Voorhees, Bill Hetrick, Clyde Latart, and of course, Jack Minzy. After a brief stint as Dean of the College of Education, Jack became the department head of Leadership and Counseling. The Department of Leadership and Counseling was well served by Jack in his reign from 1978 to 1989. His legacy included a third submission of a proposal for a doctoral program at Eastern. The third time proved to be the charm, as educational leadership is the first program to have a doctorate degree at Eastern. But wait, why don't we have the new Department Head of Leadership and Counseling, Martha Tack, say a few words. Dr. Jack Minzy, the words conjure up thoughts about terms such as respected leader, dedicated colleague, effective teacher, supportive individual, and many others that indicate a person of quality. I am delighted to have had the opportunity over the last year and a half to work with Jack in the position as department head in the Department of Leadership and Counseling. It's clear that Jack has left a legacy in the department that will make a difference forever in terms of the service orientation of the faculty, the quality of the faculty who are now on board, and his sense of commitment to community education. Jack has almost single-handedly established the doctoral program in educational leadership, which has a reputation now for service to the field and a reputation of making sure that we are providing the kind of input and service to administrators, superintendents, principals in the state of Michigan and beyond. Jack has held every position in the department, ranging from department head to coordinator of advising to coordinator of certification for administrators to full-time professional and faculty member within the department. He is a most sought-after teacher. His advice and counsel to members of the faculty in terms of service and teaching and research have certainly established him as one in a million. Jack also is an international and national expert in the field of community education. He has established and implemented the Center for Community Education that has received numerous awards, including awards at the state, regional, and national level. 
He is a sought after speaker, consultant, an individual who knows everything there is to know about his discipline. I will miss Jack terribly. He has made a significant impact on me and on the department. It is with a great deal of sadness that I watch him leave, but I wish both Jack and Esther the best of everything as they enter this new phase of their relationship. It's clear that I am not going to say goodbye because I'm going to be in touch probably daily to get personal and professional advice from this outstanding individual. Jack, we'll miss you terribly, but wish you Godspeed. Jack Menzies' impact has been awesome. He will be missed at Eastern Michigan. It is hard to say goodbye to yesterday. How do I say goodbye? The good times that made us laugh are waving back. I thought we'd get to see forever, but forever's gone away. It's so hard to say goodbye. Today. I don't know where the road is going to begin. All I know is where we've been and what we've been through. Today. And I'll take the memory to be It's so hard to say Well, kids, I hope you enjoyed that one, and now we're going to... Wrong video. Jack, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, wish you and Esther the very best in uh, retirement, but more importantly, uh, thank you for uh, being a teacher, a mentor, and a friend. I'm most uh, appreciative of the opportunity to have you as a professor and very thankful for uh, enrolling in that first community education class. Without your uh, leadership and uh, encouragement, uh, I would not have been able to achieve the success I have today in education, and I owe this all to you. I wish you the very best in retirement, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to go walleye fishing again. Best of luck. Thank you. Hi, Jack. It's uh, nice to see you again, even though I can't. Um, I want to wish you the best uh, of luck in your retirement and to remind you that for me, uh, your retirement isn't uh, going to be complete uh, 
I'll still uh, want to call you and have you speak to my class uh, over the telephone, if it's okay. And uh, I know my students would really appreciate it. I myself have um, uh, gained much from your uh, insight and your help to me in my career, and I really appreciate it. And again, best of luck to you and to Esther. Hi, Jack. Jerry, hard to recognize me beyond the black eye. Thought I had a little color to the presentation. Thought it'd be cutesy, but I think I'll just say what the rest of it is saying. Thanks an awful lot, because you've meant an awful lot to my career in community education. I know we've uh, spent time together with the intern program, and I hope I've given back as much as you have to the field. And I know I'll be seeing you again when we request your presence over at the many workshops and in-services we have in Oakland County. Uh, bless you. Thanks again. Let's add another M to the big three M's in community education. And good luck to both you and Esther. Hi, Jack. As I've said to you before, more than any person I've ever known, you have personified excellence in all three of those categories used to evaluate professors. I'm speaking about teaching, scholarship, and service. More than that, you have also been a superior administrator, both in public schools and in universities. You have truly had a brilliant career. But you're not perfect, Jack. May I suggest two areas for you to work on during your retirement? First, see if you can't overcome your shyness. You've been so timid about commenting in the College of Education Council and administrative staff. Second, develop a sense of humor. See if you can't find a joke or two that will make people laugh. Have a great retirement, Jack. Well, we made it from Texas, but our clothes didn't. We're honored to be here at Howard Hickey's retirement dinner. No, Howard, Jack. who? Jack. Jack. Oh, is this for Jack Minzy? Well, Jack, you know, every time I counted how many times you said I in a speech, it was just that I was trying to stay awake because your speeches have been so boring. But seriously, Jack, we worked together as colleagues, as center directors, and I think of you as one of my good friends, and we're glad to be here this evening. Thank you. Hi, Jack. This is Jerry. I'm calling. I'm talking to you for one thing. Uh, Judy and I received a phone call, and uh, it was from Elizabeth, Elizabeth Lake Road in Pontiac. And this guy, N. Bonaparte, called us and wanted to know if you could get a hold of a guy by the name of R. Zimmerman. And they, he kept telling him, they said, there's a bottle ready there for him, and wanted to know if he was ever going to show up. And I said, well, I'll get a hold of Jack to find out if he can get a hold of you. And so, if you can, see if that will come about. And anyway, our association has been wonderful, and we'll do everything we can, and this is a wonderful day. See you. Hi, Jack. I wouldn't have missed this for the world. Do you remember the time you told me you'd write a verse and you wrote a lot of things I can't remember, but the last one I'll never forget? Just bring your trumpet on down to Flint, and you and I will swing it. We used to have a lot of good times. Have a good year this year and all the rest of your life. We love you. Hi, Jack. Congratulations on all your accomplishments. It's so nice that you could see me on this special day. God bless you and Esther in your retirement. Hi, Jack. Your colleague, Helen, you walk tall among men. When the dust settles and you need something to do, why, give us a buzz, and we'll take you up to the summer house. Also, we have a couple new parlor games to teach you. Hi, Jack. <clears throat> retirement is something I'm looking forward to, too. and. Uh, uh, it won't be very long, another couple of years for me. It's great that you're able to retire now and enjoy so many things. Uh, one of the things I really appreciate about what you've done is uh, your interest in family and all the research you've done, and it's piqued our interest in, in researching family also. Uh, have a great retirement, uh, you and Esther, and uh, we're looking forward to the same experience. Hi, Jack. Congratulations on your retirement from Eastern Michigan University. What's your next adventure? I don't think I've ever said anything in 30 seconds in my life, but best wishes for everything. 
thank you so much for your legacy of learning that you've given me in community education. Uh, you've helped me to help my church community. You've also helped me to help my son. He is a youth ambassador to Japan in 1992 for 4-H. God bless. Hi, Jack. It's a wild Irishman. We've had many pleasant memories together at Milford High School, coaching, teaching, our, our, our barber at Charlie Schroeder's, and uh, many of the other things that we've done together, our poker club. But I have one, one thought I want to leave with you. The time that when we were coaching football, we called the huddle after a play, and Sid Hawley came running in with his high top cleats, jumped up in the air, and landed on your toe. Being your usual self, you kept your composure and said, ooh, that hurts, instead of letting out a lot of profanities. We've enjoyed our fun together, Jack, and I hope you have a very pleasant retirement. We are standing together, Jack. We are not kneeling or sitting. Thank you for six wonderful years, and I really miss you. I just want to say I want you to color code the roads and change the money in Canada and call me when you go to Flint so I can have a Coney Island with ketchup. Good luck to you and Esther. Hi, Jack. I'm still waiting for that golf game, so if you come in the summertime, come to Otisville. If you come in the winter, come to Frog Creek, Florida. Happy retirement. I'd like to say hi to both of you, uh, Jack and Esther, and just tell you what wonderful neighbors you've been, and uh, hope you continue to be neighbors, and hope we can get in a little carving, Jack. Uh, and uh, I'll probably be seeing you over the fence. I enjoyed you as a colleague and a friend, uh, and that's for both of you. From the Thayer family, Lou, Jean, Allison, Shannon, and Scam. Hi, Jack. Congratulations, you great, big, wonderful teddy bear. All good men are only that way because of the wonderful wife that's behind you. What's this I heard Gansel say about Bonaparte all these years? And I'm just finding out now that you were involved in this deceit. Hey, I was looking at pictures the other day, and my kids saw this old crowd on Duke Road on the floor playing a game. Remember? Congratulations. Hi, Jack. Congratulations on your uh, long years of uh, teaching and coaching and also teaching here at the university. Uh, I just want to tell you that uh, you have free haircuts, lifetime free haircuts at my house. You have to come down to Ohio to get them. And we're also going to teach you how to ride a horse. That's something I'm sure you, you don't know how to do yet. But uh, I want to also thank you for giving my, me my first teaching job and being an influence on our early teaching years and having a lot of fun uh, at your house and with your kids and family. And you're not going to get away without hearing from me, Jack. Congratulations. We're so proud to know you. You've always made us feel that we worked with you, not just for you. And right. we just love you a lot. And congratulations. And we do expect you to come see us in Ohio. And bring Esther along, too. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jack. Congratulations and best wishes to you. It has been a real pleasure to have worked with you and for you in these last 18 years at Eastern. Uh, I know we'll see each other often, hopefully, in the next years to come, but it won't be the same at Eastern without you, and we'll really miss you. Thanks for being such a great friend and a great mentor over the years. Best wishes to you and Esther both. Bye-bye. Jack and Esther, it's been almost 20 years. I know you find that hard to believe that a person as young as I could be having 20 years of friendship. In fact, I mean, it's even illegal for me to be drinking this this evening, but on your behalf, I'll do so. I thought all these years the mentoring that you did for me was um, out of very unselfish motives. Now I realize that it was just to get another person into the workforce to help you um, live your retirement in a way in which you are accustomed. Thank you for the years of inspiration, both personally and professionally. For that, I dearly love both of you, and thank you for that. Jack, congratulations on your retirement. I'm so happy to be here tonight to share this moment with you. Your wit, your intellect, your commitment has served as an inspiration for so many of us, and I thank you for giving me my career. Enjoy your retirement. I am sure you will redefine the word retirement as you've redefined education in this state. Jack, uh, I'd like to congratulate you for your retirement. I'd like to express my appreciation and our board appreciation for all the fine words about Willow Run. Keep up the good word for us. You always inspired me and encouraged me. Best wishes. Hope to see you again. Hello, Jack. I'm glad I could be here to see this wonderful turnout. 
I hope you'll keep up the good work after you retire and uh, do what you want to do and live a long life. Thank you. Jack and Esther, for the many years of happy memories, few tears, and sand in the tent, my family and I wish you the very best. To both of you, all our love. I have many things to thank you for, Jack. One of them, I don't know if you remember, you took me to, to kindergarten when you were in high school. That's definitely not something that everybody does. Another thing is, when I was in junior high, you used to write me letters when you were in uh, the Army. And I remember that very fondly. I also want to thank you because you're my favorite cousin and also my favorite college professor. Congratulations, Jack. Uh, this has been long awaited. I know that you've looked forward to it. I want to thank you for all the things you've done for Roxanne and I over the years. Again, hope you look, enjoy yourself. Thank you. Jack and Esther, thank you so much for the wonderful hospitality you showed me during my husband's illness. And as a member of the Stimson clan, we're proud to call you one of us, and you make each of our family gatherings special. And if you have, the, I know you have the zest and the spirit for life that my dear Aunt Floyd had, your mother, then your, only, your life is only beginning. Congratulations, Jack. We're, uh, we're part of the rent -a crowd that's uh, going to help you celebrate, and they told us we only got four minutes before you get here. so. Uh, We'll congratulate you. Uh, come canoeing with me sometime. I know you'll have, uh, have a chance. Congratulations again. Jack, I thought you'd been retired forever. Um, you've been having just too darn much fun with your work. Now I hope you can really enjoy your retirement for real. I don't know what I'm doing here. I came here to watch the Super Bowl on big screen TV. This isn't it, I take it. Well, if it's a retirement party from Menzies, then I'm glad for that. Esther, he's a zircon in the rough. Take good care of them. Jack and Esther, enjoy. Okay, Coach Benzie, this is uh, some people out of your past from Milford High School. You may not recognize me now, but I'm Tom Sanford, played forward on your, your basketball team. I want to congratulate you on retirement, and I want you to know that the team is real proud of you. We're glad that we formed your career such that you could go on to greater glory, uh, such as you have. Best luck in retirement. Jack, when your former basketball team all has gray hair, it's time to retire. Hi, and I used to be Joyce Shaw, and I'm here just to cheer you on from one of the old cheerleaders. Jack, we're really sorry we lost that last game. Jack, I'm sorry you're old enough to retire, but I'm happy you're going to retire. Why well, I'm particularly sad you're old enough to retire is I'm just a little bit younger. You've been my leader, and I'm waiting to have you lead me into retirement. And I found Clyde to come along too. <laughs> Jack, uh, I was impressed with you in the beginning. and I tried to get uh, you to come with me. And uh, my opinion hasn't changed throughout the years. Best of luck to you in retirement. I hope you just, everything goes well with you. Jack, on behalf of the uh, poker club and what we used to do, uh, just wish I had a big cigar now. Uh, it seemed like the old times. But anyway, congratulations and keep on going. Okay, dear. Hi, Jack. We just want to wish you well and hope that your retirement uh, is a very happy time. But we also want to let you know that we don't uh, intend to let you get away from us. We'll be seeing you every other week at least in bowling, and I do promise to try to be better. Hi, Jack. Just remember all those trips out east that we made back in the early community ed days. Happy retirement. Hi, Jack. Um, we really hadn't planned to do this, but they convinced us that if we could think of something good to say, that we should do this. Now, I've been thinking for the last three or four days, and it's one of the biggest challenges I've had in the last month or so. <laughs> in all seriousness, Jack, it's really been great knowing you and working with you and especially bowling with you. We assume you will still challenge us as you always have and consistently beat us as you always have. Good luck, Jack. Great. <laughs> hey, Jack, we're glad we could be here at your retirement party. And we certainly enjoyed knowing you and bowling with you. I wish we had, had gotten to know you sooner. 
and there's no question that, that uh, you've been an inspiration to everybody that you've come in contact with. And of course, as you realize, this year I'm officially the secretary of the Bowling League. And what I'm going to do is what I did with that. I'm going to designate Dixie to finish the rest of this. So uh, designee for secretary, finish the, uh, you're my designee as speaker now. Hi, Jack. It's a real honor to be here tonight. And I want to congratulate you. And we will see you bowling. And you never know, we, the strikers may be number one. So keep watching, and we'll be number one before the year's out. Yes. <laughs> Jack. I uh, just want to take this opportunity prior to the event taking place this evening to say hello, to tell you how much I'm looking forward to emceeing this special event for you. It's been a long time coming, partner, and you're going to get yours tonight. See you later. Are you ready? Oh, good. I just want to tell you, Jack, that Clyde practiced his speech tonight on the way. Uh, he is going to be telling a few jokes that I told him were marginal, but you know, Clyde, it's not easy to tell him what he should and shouldn't do. Um, the second part of that is that uh, I also reminded him that no matter how many jokes he tells and no, how, no matter how well he tells them, you know more and you tell them better. So uh, good luck tonight. Lots of wonderful memories. Uh, thanks a lot and uh, have a good retirement. So anytime. Jack, I can remember 20 years ago when I came to you as a member of the Ypsilanti Board of Education and asked you to help us start a community education program. And your response to me was, Marcia, that has to come from the superintendent. It has to be driven by the top person, not the school board members. And guess what? We got a community education program thanks to you. I'll always remember that, Jack. Jack, enjoy your retirement. Have a nice time in Switzerland. Sorry, I can't go with you. Jack, it's been a long time since building model airplanes to retirement. That is a long time. <laughs> enjoy your retirement. Uh, enjoy your leisure, if you have any. Jack, I wish you well in your retirement, you and Esther. Uh, now you can take her to some of the ball games. I. Uh, Recall going back many years when we both coached basketball. I'm at Ypsilanti Roosevelt, and I think you were at South Lions, and we scrimmage was our first contact. Certainly have come a long ways from an old coach. I wish you well. Jack, for me, I think one of the great fringe benefits of my coming to live in Ypsilanti and work in Ypsilanti and at EMU was the opportunity to get to know you and your family. That's a real plus for me. I'm glad to have been your colleague for a few years, and I wish you as much success and happiness in your upcoming career as you've had in your previous ones. Much love and best wishes to you and Esther and the rest of the family as you embark on a new stage of your life. Thanks. I realize that Denver Dunn probably doesn't want to be associated with the individual up here, but we have a place for him at the head table. And we will be starting with, ah, you're going to sit back there and, and pretend you don't know him or what? All right. 
we're, go we're going to start with dinner, and then we will be moving on to special events and activities, and I can't tell you, Jack, how I look forward to it. I think the expression, the political expression I've heard is what goes around comes around. <laughs> So we'll start with dinner shortly, and then we'll be back into the program. tribute uh, underway. Uh, before I start, I would like to introduce a person in the audience that is very special to our guest, uh, our honored guest. Uh, would Clyde Campbell please stand? Everything that Jack Minzie is today is a result of Clyde Campbell, and I know Clyde, I promised I would never divulge that connection, <laughs> but I, I apologize at this point. Also from uh, Texas, Mr. and Mrs. Robert Barrage, would they stand? Uh, they didn't know whether they, want, they thought this event was worth dressing up for or not, and uh, I see that they decided it wasn't. Uh, glad you're here. I understand there also is a little problem with a plane, but uh, after all, that's, that's the way things go. You know, it was interesting to me as, as, um, as we came in, and a number of people came up and they, they said, you know, I can't believe that Jack Minzie does not know about this event, that everyone could keep it secret. He said, he's just too sharp for that. I can assure you that he didn't and he wasn't.
You know, Jack and I go back uh, many years, and um, it always used to be of concern to me when I would be introduced by Jack uh, for some program that we would share. And I am reminded of the time that he introduced me as the person who at the age of 33, of only 33, had already reached the peak of a rather mediocre career. <laughs> and I have looked for an opportunity since that time. And Jack, you know, I don't plan to be vindictive, but plans have a way of not working out. So we, we, we will go on from there. I, I thought, you know, this evening is supposed to be an evening of sharing and sharing insights and understandings and uh, fond remembrances of Jack. And I thought I would start now by telling you one that you probably don't know because it goes back to Jack and Esther's early marriage. And you probably don't know that after their wedding night, Esther came to Jack and said, you know, I really feel badly. I have a confession that I must make to you. She said, I know I should have told you before we were married, but I really feel that I need to tell you now. Of course, Jack was pretty nervous, and Esther said, you know, I have asthma. Jack said, thank God, I thought you were hissing me all night. <laughs> well, we are starting the program this evening with a special video, a tribute to the life and times of Jack Minzy. You know, 20 years ago even, videos weren't even dreamed of at that time. And when, when Jack was growing up, sound movies were a big deal. <laughs> Cars didn't have electric starters, and so things have really changed. Now, I need to tell you that because you need to understand that there is no original footage of Jack's early years that you're going to see in this video. In fact, we really wouldn't want any if it was available. <laughs> this video that you're going to see is, going, is a rather stylized, glamorized, artistic version of a rather pedantic, boring life. And so what we're going to try and do is show you a little bit of Jack's life, and that will be followed by some special entertainment. With that, the life and times of, of the light of Jack Minzy. Well, how you doing, Jack? <laughs> it's coming along, huh? You know, as you attend a retirement event, I suppose it often occurs to those that haven't retired how you know when it's time. Jack explained that to me once. He said, it's time to retire when, you're get, when getting a little action means your prune juice is working. <laughs> we're, we're going to start next a family tribute. And I, I thought I would start by telling you a little bit about uh, Jack's three sons. Did you know all three of Jack's boys entered law enforcement, and yet Jack has had no connection, at least none that we know of, uh, with law enforcement in the past. And I wanted to explain that there is a psychological principle at work here where the siblings try to overcome the sins of the father. <laughs> Jack has a problem with kleptomania, and I don't know that that's been mentioned before, but I happened to be with Jack once when this occurred. You probably noticed in the recent years that uh, Jack always goes to conventions with Esther. He was allowed out once, and uh, we were at a conference, and uh, uh, Jack said something about getting pie. I'm changing the story a little bit, you can tell. <laughs> said something about getting pie, it was late at night, snuck down into the kitchen, doors locked on him, and he was trapped, and he was panicked. And of course, out of that, the story got back home, and, and they, they decided they really couldn't trust him to be on his own again. So. Uh, I just wanted you to know that there is a relationship to the, to the boys uh, being in law enforcement, even if it isn't a real clear one. And with that, I would like to introduce uh, two of the begats and begatters, Officers David and Dan Minzy, and a tribute from the family. Thank you. 
It really is an honor uh, to be up here and represent the family on this occasion of my dad's retirement. I'm glad Dr. Latart brought that up. Uh, as children often do rebel against their parents, I guess it isn't uncommon for uh, the sons of a farmer to move to a city or the sons of a military man uh, to join the Peace Corps. And I guess we'll leave it at pure speculation as to why all three of his sons actually did become police officers. <laughs> We're really here today to celebrate the accomplishments. And it probably wasn't until I became a father that I realized that the, there is a price to success. Uh, the missed school plays, the missed uh, ball games, uh, the meals away from home. Uh, when you do get home, uh, all of a sudden you're in the role of disciplinarian when what you really want to do is go out and play catch. And they, make no mistake about it, uh, my dad was strict when we were growing up. In fact, it wasn't until I was in the fifth grade that I found out my name wasn't Damn It Dave. <laughs> But like everybody else, uh, this will be coming out in my book uh, entitled... <laughs> It'll be called Daddy Dearest. <laughs> College professor by day, transsexual Satan worshiper by night. <laughs> Those of you who know my father know that uh, he's really not known for his lavish spending. Uh, <laughs> In fact, he's Scottish by every sense of the definition. I remember growing up that uh, to save some money one time, he thought that he would sharpen our ice skates. Uh, he really thought it was just a matter of uh, taking a file to the edge of the skates. What he didn't realize is ice skates, of course, have kind of a concave aspect to the blade. In fact, what he did was to file the blades completely flat. Uh, so we go out on the ice, and I, literally nobody could even stand up. Uh, in fact, uh, all you could see was a, this family was a blur of elbows and knees. And uh, I recall a woman who was skating nearby turned to her husband and said, look, honey, I think it's genetic. <laughs> uh, taking a clue from that, though, uh, my brothers and sister and I got together and we thought, what would be an appropriate gift? Uh, so we thought, well, maybe a ring would be nice. So we went out, we priced various rings, and uh, they were terribly expensive. I thought, well, you know, I could probably make one. Uh, <laughs> in terms of quality, it might not be as good, but uh, the sentimental aspect, of course, would make up for that. And in retrospect, I probably should have purchased a how-to manual in regards to jewelry making, but, of course, there's another five bucks. So uh, I did. I, I made a ring, and... Uh, in fact, I took it to a jeweler up in Lansing. I wanted his opinion, and I think he, he thought it was quite nice. And I think what he was telling me was to continue to make these rings at night because he told me not to give up my day job. <laughs> so so I will, I'll leave this ring, and I'll pass this ring along the table here. Uh, I think you're going to be impressed uh, with the quality. <laughs> <laughs> this retirement really is the retirement of two people. Uh, my father, of course, uh, and his first wife, my mother. <laughs> In an era where uh, people tend to change partners uh, many times like we change clothes, she's provided the encouragement and support uh, for 38 years now. Uh, she truly is one who can play so many different roles, but whose role nobody else can play. Uh, to be honest with you, though, I am concerned uh, that in retirement, my dad's going to try to help around the house. Uh, not too long ago, my mother broke her foot while playing golf, something that I'm still trying to figure out. And to help her, he decided that one morning he was going to cook her breakfast in bed. Uh, so he thought he'd fire up the grill and we'd make some bacon, and in the bacon grease we could make the eggs, of course, and this would be a, just a fantastic feast. So he got down there and he fired the grill up and uh, either the, he didn't monitor it closely enough or the fact that it was frozen solid, uh, there was a problem. And, and probably if we could visualize a scene from the movie Backdraft, we'd probably have a, a better understanding of what happened. Uh, eventually he's able to put the fire out and uh, he thought, well, you know, if I just scrape this black part off, uh, there's, there's still some grease here that I could cook the eggs in this. Valvoline grease in the bottom of this pan, and so he cooks the eggs. And it not only looked bad, it tasted terrible, and she ate it. 
In fact, I think the Valvoline probably would have stayed down better uh, than this concoction. I have a letter here from a uh, used helicopter salesman up in Lansing that I'd like to read. It says, Dear Dr. Menzi, as governor of the state of Michigan, let me join the chorus of applause and appreciation for more than 40 years of dedicated service you have provided to the citizens of Michigan. It is indeed an honor to pay tribute to someone who has worked so hard to positively affect the education of the citizens of this state. During your many years as an educator in the state of Michigan, you have held a number of positions as a teacher, counselor, coach, principal, professor, and department head. You have inspired students to reach for new horizons and achieve their fullest potential. Your commitment and dedication to educational excellence has been a tremendous asset to Eastern Michigan University, the state of Michigan, and the United States. As you enter this new stage of your life, I only hope that you have put aside enough time to do the things that you've always wanted to do. I wish you all the good things that retirement has to offer. Once again, good luck and congratulations on a job well done. Sincerely, John Engler. On the behalf of the family, I'd like to say that we're very proud to be here today. Uh, life is full of many choices, and choosing your parents aren't among those. But on behalf of my brothers Dan and John and my sister Deb, I'd like to say that had we been given the choice, we'd still be here today. I really can think of no better professional honor uh, that anyone could bestow upon my father than that of teacher. Having spent a considerable time in the college classroom myself, I think we could use less instructing and professing and a lot more teaching. And he teaches not only by his word, but also by his example. There is no wisdom greater than kindness, and kindness springs from respect. I can think of no greater honor personally uh, that can befall a man than that of dad. Anyone can be a father. A very few men become a dad. So on behalf of the family, on this occasion of his retirement, I would like to say, Congratulations to our dad. I am really impressed. You know John Engler? <laughs> and he writes to you? There's a uh, group of um, a homeless that are forming. They, 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 were, they were looking for you when you leave. I thought I'd, I'd mention that there, there's some folks who want to meet you out there. Many, uh, I'm sure here, didn't realize that Jack had a professional life before he came to Eastern. Many of us know him uh, since his arrival at Eastern. But I'm sure, as most of you know, or as some of you know at least, he started at Milford and became the high school principal there. Now, I didn't know him back then, but I personally learned a little bit about his work uh, when he became a mod intern, uh, when that was when we first met. And I remember it because at that time, Clyde Campbell, during the interview, extracted a promise from Jack that he would never be an administrator again if they selected and let him in the program. Now, you can all uh, all of those uh, who have worked with him since, either as director of the center or department chair or dean of the College of Education, know that he kept that promise. <laughs> but here to tell you a little bit more about those mysterious early years that Jack has covered up all of these years, a friend from way back, Denver Dunn. Denver? Uh, if you'll just bear with me, sometimes when I do these, I kind of wander around, but it all comes out, we hope, at the end. Let me acquaint you a little bit with Milford. Milford is a, a, a village. It's not a town. It's the village of Milford. It's about 30, 35 miles north of here, depending on if you stop on the outskirts or drive right downtown. <laughs> uh, we're 30 or 35. 
And I've tried to figure out uh, what the population of the area is, and I've worked it out this way. We have about 10,000 students in the school district there. It's Huron Valley School District. And I figured that would be, if they each had two parents, and some of them don't, some of them a single parent, then you have some families that have them more than one student in there, so when you factor that in, and then you factor in the student, those parents that don't have any children there, I think we have around 25 or 30,000 people in that immediate area. Now just bear with me, I'm gonna get there. So I would like for you to believe that we had this big town meeting, you know, that eight or 10 people came out, uh, that knew Jack, and said, we want you to go and represent Milford. I'd like for you to believe that, but that's not really true. I just kind of lucked out into this, and I want you to know that I'm honored to be up here doing this for Jack. I, I see some of you kind of elbowing, saying, the old boy's not from around here, is he? <laughs> and I've always been amazed at how Northerners grasp the obvious. Just, just amazed by that. I had to be from Southern Illinois. Anybody here from Illinois at all? Where are you from, ma'am? Chicago. That's in Northern Illinois. Um, I had to be a, a Southern Illinois Saluki. And I'm not gonna tell you what that is. I'll be up here afterward. If you'd like to find out, I'll be happy to share that with you. But when I attended Southern Illinois University, Eastern Michigan was in our conference. And I, I remember some, uh, one of the fellows from down there came up here and said, hell, they all live out there on lakes and little shanties. He'd never had seen ice from Southern Illinois, but he was quite amazed at the ice fishermen. But anyway, uh, uh, let, let me get into this. Okay, Jack, enough background. But anyway, when I read on there there was a Milford tribute, I said, I better look up tribute so I know what I'm talking about when I get up there. I always think of these things as a roast but a tribute kind of threw me off. So I looked in the dictionary and there were several definitions, but I kind of thought that the one they wanted me to use, the committee, was the one that says to utter words of praise. And I can do that. I'm ca I can, but I'm not gonna. I could do that. So I went to the archives at the Huron Valley Schools and the lady said there, we have purged his files. And besides that, they'd, hell, they'd taken everything out of them. <laughs> but um, we knew Jack as, as kind of a mover and a shaper. You know, so I said shaper, not shaker. A shaper of students. And he was very good at that. And I'll tell you a little more about uh, the mover later. But let me give you some background on Jack that uh, was alluded to some in here. And I'm always worried about if I'm down at the bottom of the line, everybody's going to take everything that I already have and mark it off. But luckily, I'm up near the front, and whoever behind me, they've just got to sweat it out that I don't take some of their material. But Jack graduated from Roosevelt High School, and they mentioned that in there, and I thought, oh boy, here goes my speech. But that's all they said. They didn't tell you that he was four years varsity basketball there at the high school. His senior year, he was a high point man. In his junior year, he was a runner-up for High Point men. In college, he was on the junior varsity here as a freshman and a varsity as a sophomore, but then he had to quit to go to work. But he did play on his fraternity team in the city league, and he was High Point man two years in a row. And then when he went in the Army, on our side, Jack coached and captained his team to third place out of 16. So he has quite a background in basketball, and I will get into this a little later in more detail. Jack graduated from Michigan State Normal College, often referred to as Eastern Michigan University. He graduated in 1950, and they used to be called the Hurons at that time. And I always kind of thought that that's a reason he went to Huron Valley, because he liked that. He liked Huron. He came to Huron Valley Schools in 1950. His first assignment was a junior high school. His second assignment was a Milford High School. For there he was assistant football coach and varsity basketball coach. And he took a basketball team, and as I understand it, 
that uh, further than any other coach and, and over, for over 30 years, and I think it was 88, Jack, that they finally achieved that, 1988. And I understand that that team is here that he tucked that for, part of them. Would they please stand? We'd like to take a look at you guys. <clears throat> Now that's a, a third, over a 30 year record that he's maintained. His third assignment there was junior high principal. I tell you, the guy couldn't keep a job, they just kept moving him around. His fourth assignment was high school principal and that's where I first became acquainted with Jack. And this does point out that he was a mover. And speaking of moving, as far as we know, Jack still has the Guinness Book of Record, or at least in Ann Arbor. Uh, and not in how low can you go in limbo, but how fast can you crawl under a paid toilet uh, door? <laughs> Jack actually did that. Can you imagine a guy that big tr crawling under one of those? But when you, when you gotta go, you gotta go. That's all there is to it. And I never always wondered what would have happened if there had been somebody in that booth. I don't know what Jack would have done at that time, but anyway, he has the record on that. And Jack, uh, he moved there then and went to the Mott Institute of where he worked, as they mentioned, Michigan State, and then ended up here at Eastern Michigan. And Jack, let me put it to you like this. She graduated from MSNC, Michigan State Normal College, slash EMU, went to HVS, then HJHS, then MHS, then MJHS, then MHS, then MOTT, then MSU, then EMU, and now he's ready for AARP. <laughs> <clears throat> now here are the words of an ex-superintendent about Jack. Here is a clean cut chap with a good personality, above average scholarship, and willing to put in extra time if necessary to get the job done. Now I'd just like to tell you some of the personal things and, that I've had with Jack. When uh, Jack had an office, and the fellow that preceded him, I was pretty fond of, and I didn't know Jack at this time. He was at the junior high, and I was at the high school. And we were gonna lose the other principal, and I kind of felt bad about that. When Jack came, I was so glad the other guy left, I just uh, couldn't hardly control myself. But I remember walking by Jack's office one day. They had a little inner hall with, uh, from the outer hall. That's the way inner halls are, you know. And anyway, so as I walked back, Jack come in, said, come in. And I thought, uh-oh. Anytime the other principal invited me in, I was going to be doing something extra. But Jack just wanted to talk. He just wanted to tell me a story or just talk. And uh, the kind of stories he would tell were kind of subtle, very, very, uh, very good. Now, this story I heard, and, I, I, uh, and Jack was with me when I heard this, and it may, uh, he may remember this. And Bill Golden, you'll love this. This is about an Irishman. See, I'm part Irish, Indian, and hillbilly, so I'm not going to offend anybody other than myself. But this Irishman was in a terrible accident, went right through the windshield and it severed his ears off. So he was out of work for quite a while. Finally, he called his boss and he said, I'm, I'm coming back to work uh, Monday. So his boss went to his partner. He said, now listen, when Patty comes back, said, don't say anything about his ears. And the, the guy said, what do you think? I'm some kind of sad. I said, I, well, I wouldn't say a thing. I just, I love him. I just, I wouldn't do anything like that. So he came in and he said, Patty me lad. I, my dialect, I do a good Irishman, which you like. Patty, me lad, said, we're so glad to see you. I said, we've just missed you so. I said, just, I just love you so. He said, and I'm really glad to see your eyesight's improved. He said, well, why would you say that? He said, well, you aren't wearing your glasses. <laughs> but, <laughs> but this would be the kind of jo uh, a joke that Jack, uh, do you remember where we heard that, Jack? You remember? Okay. Uh, let me tell you another thing I remember. One day, I was down at Cobo Hall, and Jack was down there at a community education. I think it's kind of a national conference. And Esther and I were walking. We were trying to go into the display, and we were trying to get from here down to there with Jack. And we'd take about two steps, and somebody would collar him. We'd take another two steps, and somebody, I said, Esther, we're never going to make it. I said, let's just leave him, and we'll go on because he knows everybody in the nation in community ed, probably, or they know him. 
So we did go on, but that's the kind of a person Jack is. He stops and talks with him and ignores his wife and myself. The other thing I want to mention is Jack is really quite a humanitarian. We went on the senior trip together and the first night out, one of the students became quite ill. But Jack insisted that I stay and sleep. He said, because you have the next 72 hours. <laughs> One other uh, group I'd like to mention is the poker club here. And uh, I am next to the youngest member of that club. I, I don't mean an age. I mean, I haven't been in the club that long. And I don't know when this club started. I got to guess 30 years ago, at least 30 years ago. 61, 19, that'd be 30. Yeah, that'd be 30 years, going on 32, 31. Uh, but they decided probably that I was the best poker player because I remember we, we drove over here one night, uh, it'd be about 70 mile round trip, and I won 17 cents. <laughs> so it, it, was a, it was a worthwhile evening. <laughs> and we have uh, our poker club, and I think they're all here with the exception of two right now, and some of them that, that uh, uh, may be back that I don't aware of. Would anybody that was ever in the poker club or had sitting now, would you please stand, please? Yeah, we have uh, uh, two new ones there. I see Denny Ball stood up and Chuck Schroeder from Ohio, and Denny's at Western Michigan University over there. But anyway, uh, we have a hard time getting poker players in Milford because they just don't want to play the stakes that we, that we use. We're up to three cents now. That's the limit. Now you can bump three times, but it's gonna cost you 12 cents when you do that. So uh, you, you've got to just be careful. <clears throat> and uh, I would, in, in closing, and I know that's the word people love to hear, and in closing, I'd like to say this about Dr. Jack Menzies. He doesn't treat colds or bursitis or anything like that. But anytime I'm with Jack or I have heard him speak, I always feel better. And I think everybody else that knows Jack does. Thank you. Now, I hope, Jack, that you're noticing that we're sparing no expense this evening. We brought somebody from another country that can't speak English. Denver done. And we're moving on with your life. And we're now getting to more recent events at Eastern Michigan University. And you know, many have raised questions as to why Jack stayed at Eastern as long as he has. Others have raised the question is, how could he have stayed at Eastern? as long as he did. In fact, I often remember in meetings with the vice president, they often said, how in the world can Jack Minzy still be here? And I thought that was always an interesting question, but it was one that they never had a good answer for. One of them, in fact, described Jack once, and I thought it was probably the best description I've had of, of Jack. They said, Jack is, is a professional who's both good and original. Unfortunately, what he's good at isn't very original, and what his original work is, isn't very good. But to tell you a little bit more about Jack, here at EMU is Donna Schmidt. I'd like to read, I, in preparation for this, I decided one of the best sources uh, for information before I got to Eastern, because uh, I've only been at Eastern 18 years, and, and Jack, of course, has been there longer was to check out Jack's personnel file down in the department. So I went down to the department and there's, you have to envision about 10 file cabinets lined up with lots of different files in it and there's a file cabinet for the guidance and counseling staff and all their visiting lectures, maybe about 55, 60, 70 people. And then there's the ed leadership file for all the professors and the visiting lectures and then there's a file for Jack, <laughs> separate. Almost. It was by far the fat, fattest personnel file I've ever seen, probably about as wide as this podium. 
Every letter that Jack ever got from anybody, he put in there. He had a little note in there once to his secretary. He said, put this in my file. I may want to be promoted someday. So <laughs> anyway, I did find some treasures, and I'd like to share a couple of them with you. November 6, 1967, 916 Burlington Drive, Flint, Michigan, 48503. Dr. Frank Daly, Chairman, Department of Education, Eastern Michigan University, Ypsilanti, Michigan, 48197. Dear Dr. Daly, I have discussed with Dr. Brower and Dr. Grinstead a potential opening in your Department of Education, which would include, among its responsibilities, working with the intern program in Flint. I would be interested in being a candidate for such a position. Following Dr. Brower's advice, I have sent my credentials, and he should receive them in the next few days. Please let me know if there is more that I should do in making application for this position. Sincerely, Jack D. Minzy. And with that letter, started Jack's professional career, professional service career at Eastern Michigan University. I found then the letter that was mailed back to Jack in response from Frank Daly, who said, among other things, that there would be an interview and that they make appointments at various ranks and levels and so on. And at the present time, they were offering salaries between $8,500 and $15,000 for the academic year. But in addition to that, he could earn one-sixth of his base salary for six weeks of teaching during the summer, and so on. Then there were some notes, and these are all original documents. There were some notes on the candidate. Evidently, Jack had been in for his interview. And there are six points enumerated here. One, he has his doctorate in educational administration. Two, he is an Eastern undergraduate. Three, has considerable teaching experience. Four, has six years of administrative experience at the elementary, junior high, and high school levels. Five, has completed the mod internship experience. Six, has been close to the program and at times has represented Michigan State on Board of Governors. And, and seven, has good recommendations from Michigan State when he served as regional director of continuing education. So Jack was successful and he was appointed in uh, 1968 as an assistant professor in the Department of Educational, well, at that time, it was the um, uh, Department of Education. And I'd like to list a few other people who were at Eastern at that time because it kind of gives a vignette for Jack. Gary Hawks, whom some of us know most recently as the interim super, state superintendent of education, was director of personnel at Eastern Michigan University at the time. Frank Daly was the acting head, Department of Education. It was all one big department at that time. George Brower was the chair of the administration and supervision division of that department. And the appointment form, the official appointment form used by the university at that time, had a space down at the bottom where it said, who did the typing of the form? And the typist of Jack's original appointment form was Kathy Kimling, whom I think many of you remember was the dean's secretary for so many years. Uh, so in 1968, in September, Jack started as the assistant professor at Eastern Michigan University with the base salary of $11,300, which was, of course, considerably above the $8,500 that they were paying for the, uh, the real rookies. He had teaching responsibilities, and he was the EMU representative to the Mott Intern Program in Flint, Michigan. In January of the following year, 1969, only four months later, Eastern Michigan University got the Mott Center Grant, which was a very large sum of money from the Mott Foundation, to provide programs and services throughout Michigan and Pennsylvania and Ohio and, and uh, New York in the area of community education. And Jack was appointed the first director of the Mott Center for Community Education at Eastern Michigan University. And he got an increase in pay to $12,000. He taught one class, and he also taught in the springtime and the summertime, besides during the regular semesters. In 1970, he was promoted to associate professor, and in 1976, to full professor, serving one year as acting dean of the College of Education at Eastern. And in 1978, he was appointed head of the Department of Ed Leadership, which he held until 1989, at which time he uh, became the full professor in the department for the last year and a half. Now, that's kind of the main framework. But you have to round all that out with all these other wonderful experiences that Jack included during, during his uh, stint at Eastern Michigan University. Uh, there were lots of big things and lots of little things. Uh, some, some of the big things uh, were traveling across the country 
on these uh, blitz tours to, to announce community education to the world in exotic places like Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, and Pulaski, New York, and uh, Wakahashi, Texas, and Nashville, Indiana, uh, Canaan Valley, West Virginia, and in some really exotic places like Banff, Alberta, Canada, and Auckland, New Zealand, and Dublin, Ireland, and other places around the world. Jack has always represented to Eastern uh, and to all of us enthusiasm, professionalism at its highest standards. Uh, he's always had it, showed talent and enthusiasm, been upbeat. He's been, for many of us, a mentor. He's certainly been a strong professional in every respect of the word. He's been director, he's been dean, he's been department head, he's been an advocate. But most of all, he's been a colleague and a friend and a mentor. And we will miss him, and we appreciate him, and hopefully we'll be half as good as he is when we're ready to retire. Thank you. Well, Jack, now it's finally my turn. I have the opportunity to give the collegial tribute. And I thought I would start by clearing up a few old issues, and I'm the only one that can do this, and it refers to the co-authorship of our book. As you know, most people believe that the senior author of that book is Jack Minzy, and it's Minzy and Letarte. I want to start by sharing with you a book that I brought along that clearly on the front cover says Clyde Letarte first and then Jack D. Minzy. Now, you should understand that, that this cover came as close to destroying our friendship as anything I can think of. We had, when we wrote the book, we had agreed to flip a coin as to whose name appeared first, and we did, and I lost, and Jack never would share the coin he used but in any event, I accepted the loss. It was my duty to then take the book to the publisher, and I did. And the next thing we received was the fly, the, the uh, dust cover, and it had my name first. And Jack came in and said, how could this happen? I said, Jack, I don't know. I can't, I gave them the name as we agreed. It was a terrible, terrible time, but he finally did believe it when the book came out, and it was reversed, and we were talking about the change. The other thing I want to share with you is that Jack really wasn't the co-author. Esther was. <laughs> we felt badly for Jack's professional career and felt that it was better for him if we pretended he had written, but actually Esther and I spent weeks writing that book, and I want you to understand that. I, you know, one of the th interesting things about Jack, and, and I think those of you that know him know this, Jack loves to take on causes. And I can't, I can't remember a better cause for him to have taken up than the one I'm going to share with you. He came in one day to the office, and he was furious with the bank. The bank had, had bounced a check but he had cashed. And he went over to the bank and found out that the bank determined that at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, after 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it was the next day. Jack said, how can you do that? You can't just determine the next day whenever you want. I got my money in at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And so I was there on the right day, and they said, well, that was their, their policy was that after that, it was 3 o'clock. Jack took that all the way to the board of that bank. He was absolutely furious, but he was not going to allow that bank to determine what day uh, he, had, he had put his money in. There are also um, uh, those that wonder once in a while about Jack's tenure at EMU, and it's really a fairly simple uh, process that Jack used. Those of you that have ever been in his office have always seen a current picture of the president of the university, right where anybody can see it. Well, the reality is that the only time J Jack ever panicked in terms of his tenure was when there was a, a change in presidents and he hadn't gotten the picture yet. But once he got the picture, he'd always invite the president over, uh, the new president over, and they'd just sit around and talk, and of course, the, the new president would every once in a while notice 
that Jack had his picture on his desk and was always very impressed. And so Jack's tenure was always a, a very positive and, and uh, uh, assured thing at, at, at the college. Well, I don't want to just go on with, with some memories. I do want to talk a little bit seriously, I guess, um, because I know Jack's up next. And uh, I have many wonderful memories of sharing friendships and professional experiences with Jack Minzie. We've shared an exciting commitment to an educational philosophy together. We've shared many opportunities, opportunities to challenge each other's thinking, to discuss ideas, creative thinking, a variety of things. It has been a wonderful opportunity for me as I've grown professionally and grown professionally through Jack Minzie. But I think the things that most intrigued me and impressed me about Jack are his integrity, and his personal caring. He's there when he's needed. He's a friend that's always willing to help. He's a true academic. He cares as much for his students as he cares for his subject. But mostly for me, he's just a friend, a friend that I will treasure. I look forward to seeing him more and more frequently now that he has more time. It's been a wonderful experience for me knowing and working with Jack Minzie. And with that, as I promised him, I would give him an opportunity for a response and a few remarks. Jack Minzi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that. And, uh, I'll not be long. Uh, I heard one time somebody said that uh, bad kidneys are more the result of uh, good manners than bad liquor. And so uh, I know you've been sitting here for a long time, and, and uh, I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, uh, probably kind of bad to enter the, in the program with a college professor because they're not known for being particularly witty or, or informational or entertaining. Um, a story I heard one time about a young lady who said to a college professor, Professor, would you mind retrieving my camera for me? And should I drop it in the pool? And she, he said, well, I wouldn't mind doing that. But he said, why would you ask me? you got all these other virile young lifeguards here. Why would you ask me? She said, well, I don't think you recognize me, Professor, but I've been in three of your classes, and I found you can go down deeper, stay down longer, and come up drier than anybody I've ever met. <clears throat> I knew Clyde was going to get at me today, but that's the kindest, that's the nicest uh, form of flattery. Uh, when Clyde left Eastern Michigan University, I was the master of ceremonies, and uh, I did give him a shot, and I deserve some getting back today, and I was very nostalgic because he's wearing the same coat he had that night, and that was 15 years ago. <laughs> uh, I have to tell you the truth, that, that I have always operated on the best way of what I call planned spontaneity. I've always been able to get up in front of people, and but I always was a little prepared and had things together, and uh, I was totally shocked. Those of you that are in the back of the room uh, saw the expression on my face, and it was a very emotional thing when I walked in here, and, and uh, it, it was very appreciated, but it's that combination of, of appreciation and, and uh, anxiety, I guess, and so uh, I was very shocked, and, and fortunately for you, I did not come prepared to say a lot of things. Um, I, wanna, I wanna thank all the people who uh, did all of this, and I'm not sure I know all of them, but I know my youngsters had a had a good spot in the program, and and had a good deal to do with this, and uh, and uh, it's kind of nice to sit back and watch your own kids perform, and and uh, watch them grow into their own, and uh, I know that Clyde had a major part in this in terms of preparing the comments, getting things together. I never seen anything like this, that I don't know that Art McCaffrey's had a role in it, and he's been a long and lasting friend for many, many years, way back to those years when he was at uh, a sophomore in high school, was boasted most likely not to succeed, and, <laughs> and, uh, and we keep on crossing paths, so I think we are star-crossed, and my association with him has just been great, and I know that Art would not have much to do with it without knowing that Arlene probably had a major part to do with it, uh, because I'm sure that she uh, took care of uh, a lot of the details that would go with it, and, and of course, all of you who came tonight, uh, it's just unbelievable for me. Uh, 
uh, you know, they, uh, they say that uh, you know, I got a feeling that maybe my life's not going to be too long because they say in the last minute of your life, everything flashes in front of you. <laughs> and I look out here and at every table I see a story and people who, uh, who I would just love to spend an hour or two with to just talk about the good old times and chances to get together. And, uh, and uh, so I, I just most appreciate it for you for coming. Uh, if I could have one wish granted right at this moment, it would be that um, I would be articulate enough to express to you how much this really means to me. Uh, this is, uh, and I'm so glad that they did so many things here so that I can have some nostalgia at later times to sit down and appreciate even more. But uh, if I could just have a way to tell every one of you how much I appreciate your being here. Um, Denny Boyle gave me a desk set, may not even remember that anymore, but he searched for many, many weeks. We, we'd been career people together and gone along and tell you the truth, a few times I probably got promoted to jobs that should have been Denny's, but he was always that guy who was there in the background to help me. And we parted ways in uh, 1965, and uh, he went to Western to, uh, to do great things at Western, and uh, I went on to Eastern. And uh, when we left, uh, he gave me a gift. It was a desk set. In fact, I just cleaned out my office, and I'm going to glue it together for the fourth time. Uh, but on it, it has a statement that says something like this. Uh, iron sharpeneth iron, so the countenance of a man is sharpened by the friends he has. And uh, I truthfully believe that. I believe that much of what's been described here this evening and much of what went on is because I had the good fortune to have a lot of good friends who supported me and helped me and... and uh, contributed just as my family did to those successes which I had. And so uh, what I really want to do is uh, I want to thank you all for being here this evening, and but most of all, uh, I want to thank all of you for being my friends. Thank you. It would be inappropriate to end this evening without making special or giving special recognition to the committee that put this together. And when I call your names, if you just stand so that we can express our appreciation to you. And Jack, you had almost all of them. You were right. Arlene Phillips, Dan and Esther Minzy, Gail Green, Jackie Tracy, Donna Schmidt, and Art McCaffrey. Let's give them a hand. And with that, I hope you spend some time getting, making sure that you say hello to Jack if you haven't had a chance to already. Drive safely on your way home, and thank you for coming. Good night. <laughs>